It was January 1916, the second year of the war. As the new year began, the German strategic situation on all fronts had stabilized. Through the course of 1915, the Kaiser's armies had advanced deep into Russia and had seemingly crushed the Tsar's capability to mount any substantial counteroffensive. Serbia had been dealt an even heavier blow from a combined German-Austro-Hungarian-Bulgarian force. This Central Power Army swept over the little country that had been the flashpoint of the conflict and chased the remnants of the Serbian army from the continent. The destruction of Serbia opened rail communications with Turkey, helping to shore up that beleaguered ally. In Italy and on the Western Front, the Central Powers had warded off a series of powerful Entente offensives and looked likely to be able to hold off any similar attacks for the foreseeable future. Despite the positive reports on all fronts, German General Staff Chief Erich von Valkenhayn was no closer to achieving the goals he had set in November 1914. Russia may have suffered crippling losses in the summer of 1915, but the Tsar still spurned Germany's offer of a separate peace. In the West, Balkenhayn had been unable to carry out an offensive aimed at dividing the Western Allies and forcing France out of the war. Consequently, Germany was forced to maintain substantial strength on both fronts and could not mass sufficient forces to defeat any one enemy in a great decisive battle. Despite the stable strategic situation, both Falkenhayn and Chief of the Austrian General Staff Count Franz Konrad von Hitzendorf were in agreement that the war would have to be ended by 1917. The two General Staff Chiefs saw that their nations would soon reach the end of their resources. Falkenhayn believed that a military means would have to be found to entice one of the Entente powers into a separate peace with Germany. That opportunity was to be found only on the Western Front. There, the German army would take the offensive for the first time since 1914, in an all-or-nothing gamble to force an end to the war. Although several powerful Entente offensives had dented the German lines in the West during the course of 1915, the German position remained largely unchanged since the end of 1914. The Western Front still consisted of a trench system that ran unbroken from just south of Ostend in the north to Federhausen on the Swiss border. Behind their respective trench works, 119 German divisions faced 96 French and 43 British divisions. Additionally, each side could draw upon significant reserves. By mid-January 1916, the Germans maintained a reserve of 25 divisions in the West, while the French reserve consisted of 24 divisions and the British of 36. Thus, the Germans faced a numerically superior foe in the West, a strong French army with generally good reserves, and a British army which had not yet reached its peak strength. Offsetting the material factors were morale and training. Early in 1915, Falkenhayn judged the French army to be deficient in both these categories and the British to be undertrained in their rush to get troops to the front. In September, Falkenhayn told the Kaiser that the French are at the end of their strength and in no condition to attack. The utter failure of the French offensive in 1915 only served to reinforce his low estimate of the French and his high confidence in the German soldier. The British soldiers, on the other hand, were seen to have a great deal of confidence in themselves and their commanders. The German intelligence section believed that the British pre-war professional army had been largely destroyed in late 1915, but it had provided the necessary cadre to form the backbone of several new divisions. The conclusion of the German intelligence section was that at the end of 1915, the British army was still a formidable foe and the French army was near exhaustion. These estimates were to shape the German strategy in 1916.
Falkenhayn faced a challenging strategic problem at the end of 1915. Although he assumed Russia would be incapable of offensive action for the foreseeable future, Russia had not been knocked out of the war. Germany still needed to maintain significant forces in the east to protect against any Russian action there, however limited. Falkenhayn could count on only 26 divisions as a reserve in the west. Across the no man's land, he faced two enemies who each possessed large reserves ensconced behind well-constructed trenches. The chief of the Imperial General Staff had to determine where and how to launch an attack with the limited resources available in 1916. Although Falkenhayn believed the British Expeditionary Force to be Germany's main enemy, Great Britain was the more difficult enemy to defeat. Falkenhayn felt that they occupied a defensive position with the highest concentration of troops anywhere on the Western Front, and this position could not be assailed with the forces at Germany's disposal. Furthermore, he believed that even if Germany were to deal the British forces a powerful blow, this would not force Britain from the war. Despite these difficulties, General Falkenhayn felt that Germany could, in 1916, convince Britain that it could never defeat Germany. In order to accomplish this, he planned to strike the British Isles' sea lifeline by unleashing unrestricted submarine warfare. As he struck a hard blow to the British belly, he also planned to knock England's best sword out of her hand by delivering a crushing blow to France and destroying the French soldiers' will to fight. On the 3rd of December, Falkenhayn apprised the Kaiser of the state of the planning for operations in 1916. General Oberst Hans von Plessen recorded the meeting in his diary. General von Falkenhayn rolled out for His Majesty a serious picture of the situation with the conclusion that to carry the war to its end, an attack in the West where all available strength has already been collected should be attempted. It is to be then that the Entente will attack us in the West and thereby bleed themselves white. Although his ideas were not clearly defined in early December, Plesson's diary entry indicates that by this point, Falkenhayn had contrived the notion that the French must be forced to attack the German positions, thereby throwing successive waves of reinforcements into a German meat grinder. He intended to attack the French at the one location where they would be forced to respond immediately with a counterattack. That location was the fortress city of Verdun, a symbol of French national pride. In 1914, before the Battle of the Marne, it had stood like a rock against repeated German assaults. If it had fallen, Paris, even the war, might have been lost. It was the hinge of the whole Allied line. At first glance, Verdun's defenses looked formidable, almost completely encircled by ridges and hills on both banks of the Meuse River. Verdun was protected by a ring of forts, 20 large and 40 small ones. The strongest cornerstone of them all was Fort Duomont, perched at a 1,200-foot height northeast of the city on the right bank. However, the strength of the forts was illusory. Many of the guns had been removed by the French General Headquarters to provide extra firepower for the autumn offensives the previous year. By 1916, more than 200 guns had been removed. On December 8th, Falkenhayn had a long discussion with Generals Tappan and Wild about an attack on the forts at Verdun. An attack on Verdun had several advantages. First, the area was well served by several rail lines and could be enhanced by the construction of several spur lines for transporting supplies and heavy rail artillery to frontline troops. Second, the fortress of Verdun sat at the center of a salient which could be dominated by the German guns. General Lieutenant Adolf Wild von Hohenborn recorded in his diary the advantage this would give. During the attack from the north and the east, 
The French positions will soon be so diminished that not even a mouse can live in them. Most importantly, Verdun was an object for the retention of which the French general staff would be compelled to throw in every man they have. The offensive would be conducted by the German Fifth Army under Crown Prince Wilhelm, the heir to the throne, thus ensuring the Kaiser's support. The Crown Prince may have been in command of the army, but his chief of staff, General Smith von Noblesdorf, was in tactical control. The first phase of the offensive was given the code named Gericht, meaning judgment. Falkenhayn's directive to the Fifth Army was to mount an offensive in the direction of Verdun, but there was no mention in this communique about capturing the city. Crown Prince Wilhelm had other ideas. The objective is to capture the fortress of Verdun by precipitous methods. It was this discrepancy in interpretation that was to cost Germany dearly. Several points were critical to the success of the plan. First, the Germans had to retain sufficient reserves to meet the expected relief offensive. Second, they had to keep sufficient forces to launch a counteroffensive once the French forces had worn themselves out in their relief offensive. And finally, Falkenhayn's plan for 1916 relied upon the enemy doing exactly what Falkenhayn wanted. 140,000 infantrymen were assembled to make the attack. Whole villages were evacuated to make room for them. The German commanders secretly massed over 1,230 artillery pieces behind the front. Siege guns, naval guns, quick firing guns, field guns and mine throwers. These were the guns that were to do the bleeding white. To supply this fearsome army, the quartermaster general of the Imperial General Staff assembled 1300 munitions trains. In an endless stream they transported two and a half million shells. With utmost secrecy, the build-up continued day and night. On the French side of the line, the alarm about the state of the defenses at Verdun had reached French general headquarters at Chantilly. The French Minister of War, Joseph Galliani, wrote to the French commander-in-chief. Reports have come to me indicating that in the Verdun region, the line of trenches appears not to have been completed. Should the enemy break through, not only would your responsibility be involved, but also that of the entire government. Joffrey replied, Nothing justifies the fears which you express in your dispatch. As preparations continued, German planes patrolled the forward areas in strength, ready to pounce on any French reconnaissance plane that might venture across the lines. The Imperial Air Corps had complete air superiority. They had assembled the greatest concentration of air power ever employed in war so far. 168 planes at Verdun and a large number of observation balloons. Now, even Joffrey became apprehensive. Our minister to Denmark telegraphed that a German offensive was being talked about. This was immediately confirmed by news from Switzerland of the concentration of 400,000 men in the region of Verdun. A regiment of engineers was immediately sent to Verdun to strengthen the defenses on the East Bank. With every tick of the clock, time was running out for the poorly prepared and outmanned French. German troops continued to pour into their forward trenches, the starting point for the grand offensive. By the thousands they came, the best troops in the German army, veterans hardened by two years of trench warfare. 24 hours before D-Day, all was ready. The troops now only had to wait for Judgment Day. Germanic efficiency had accounted for every eventuality, everything but the weather. Gales, rain and blizzards forced Falkenhayn to delay the assault scheduled to start on February 12th for nine days. Nine days of trying to hide one million battle-ready men the massed artillery, and mountains of ordnance from air reconnaissance. 
to hide from French patrols and pray that talkative deserters not give the plan away. Nine critical days for the French to bring in two more divisions of veterans in hopes of stemming the German storm about to break on Verdun. The battle opened at dawn on February 21st. 21 miles behind the German lines, a single Krupp's 38 centimeter naval gun fired the first round at a bridge spanning the Meuse. This shell missed the target, but it was the signal for the massed German artillery to unleash an unprecedented nine-hour bombardment. One heavy battery for every yard of French 1,000 guns in all. It is a war of brute material. For hours on end, you bombard them with 210s, 305s, and 380s. And when everything appears dead, when there's no more wire and no more trenches, and when the survivors have been reduced to a state of madness, they send the masses out to attack. When the French are on the receiving end, not one of them breaks through. And if there's only 10 out of 100 left, these 10 will fight on. Letter from a French soldier in the line, February 21st, 1916. More than 80,000 shells fell in the Bois de Carras alone. The Boches started to bombard us with large caliber shells for 10 hours. It was enough to drive you mad. We were buried alive, my entire squad, but miraculously, all seven of us emerged without a scratch. But of the five unlucky ones who came and took refuge with us in our dugout, two were killed and three were wounded. A soldier of the 311th Infantry Regiment, February 21st, 1916. With their rearward communications severed, the bewildered defenders were in no condition to repel a major assault. Here and there in the front line were a few men who by chance escaped. In all our minds we had the same thought, that everyone to right and left had been killed. As he waited for orders to advance, a young Hessian scribbled a last note to his mother. There's going to be a battle here, the likes of which the world has never seen. The order came over the top. The advance elements of the German army had eight miles to go. Through a lunar landscape crisscrossed by barbed wire and dotted with concrete fortifications, on they came. They moved slowly, not in a straight line, as though they were picking their way. Nothing could have looked less like an assault. Some of the Germans had containers strapped to their backs. They seemed like laborers going to spray the vines. These laborers were carrying flamethrowers. The Germans were trying out their new weapon on the French. The tons of oil propelled by compressed nitrogen turned men into flaming torches. Fortunately for the French, the German planners had been too cautious. They had given strict orders limiting infantry operations on the first day to strong fighting patrols, which would employ infiltration tactics to seek out weak spots in the French line. Only the 7th Reserve Corps commander, General Hans von Zweil, disregarded these orders and showed what might have been achieved. He deployed stormtroopers just behind the fighting patrols and in five hours secured the Bois de Amont. In the Bois de Caux, however, Emile Drian's shrewd use of strong points instead of continuous trench lines enabled the surviving chasseurs to defend that position obstinately against the German 28th Corps. On February 22nd, von Zwell was again spearheading the German assault, bursting through a regiment of territorials on the French 72nd Division's left, and at Bois de Consembois, and then seizing Amont, 
to tear open a gap in the French first line of trenches and expose the left flank of the Bois de Caux. During the late afternoon, the heroic Driant was killed while attempting to lead his shattered battalions to the safety of Fort Beaumont. In less than two hours, much of the French front line had crumbled. But the Germans were also suffering heavy losses, especially among the elite stormtroopers, losses they could ill afford. The next day, the Germans came up against an intermediate line that had only recently been created, and so was not marked on any German map. The dogged defense of Herbebois by the French 51st Division was finally over by late that evening, but overall German advances were less than expected. Ominously for the Germans, powerful French artillery was massing on the left bank of the Meuse. These developments were scant comfort to the French. Before dawn the next day, Saint-Monnot was in German hands. The 51st and 72nd Divisions were so badly mauled that they were on the verge of total collapse. Fort Beaumont fell and in less than three hours, the second French line of defense fell apart. The third Zouaves committed piecemeal to the battle with no protection from the bitter cold and the fury of the German guns melted away after being assaulted by the Brandburgers. For the first time on the Western Front since 1914, German commanders sensed a breakthrough. Few trenches faced them, not much barbed wire, open country ahead, and 10,000 French soldiers had given up the fight. They give one the impression of complete breakdown and complain loudly of their senior commanders. The Kaiser himself came up to the front to watch the kill. By nightfall on February 24th, only the forts and a few brave men barred the Germans' way. The pivotal point in the defense of Verdun, Fort Dumont, was now uncovered. On February 25th, the men of the elite 24th Brandenburg Regiment entered a gap left by the retreating 3rd Zouaves. They had no orders to capture Fort Dormont. The objective lay short of the fort, but their regimental motto was, do more than your duty. In small groups, they pushed beyond the stipulated objectives as far as Fort Dormont. Emboldened by the curious inactivity of the fort, a few pioneers under a sergeant named Kunz pressed through the outer defenses to the dry moat. Still undetected, they climbed through a gun embrasure into one of the fort's galleries. Inside the fort, the garrison numbered less than 60 overaged and undertrained territorial reservists commanded by a sergeant major. A handful of men were manning the guns. Though German 42 centimeter shells had not inflicted critical damage on the fort, the shock waves and fumes they produced had driven the majority of the defenders to shelter in the bowels of the concrete bastion. It's an unending hell. I live in a casement at the bottom of the fort with the light on day and night. You can't go out for fear of shell fragments which fall daily into the trenches and onto the fort. In a word, it is solitude in all its horror. When will this veritable martyrdom end? Letter discovered on the body of an unknown French soldier. Kunz was followed in by three other assault teams. Without a fight, the defenders of Fort Dumont, the world's most powerful fortification, surrendered. The capture of such a prize at minimal cost sparked national rejoicing in Germany. The crown prince himself decorated the brave Brandenburgers. The attackers appeared to have cleared a route into Verdun, only five miles away. In Verdun itself, confusion reigned. Whispers were exchanged. The city is lost. The commander of the French Central Army Group, 
de Langle de Carey, advocated the immediate withdrawal of all remaining French forces to the heights to the east and southeast of the fortress city. However, the combative de Castelnau at French general headquarters opposed this withdrawal. Having ensured that General Henri Philippe Pétain's second army would be brought out of reserve to hold the left bank of the Meuse, he also called for Pétain's area of responsibility to embrace the right bank of the Meuse, which was to be defended at all costs. Pétain, a peasant from northern France, was a colonel due for retirement at the start of the war. Now Pétain was summoned to come forward as the savior of France. The soldiers had heard the stories told of Pétain. They knew he cared for his troops and that he was frugal with men's lives. The diminutive general would have preferred to withdraw to a new defensive position. Pétain understood modern firepower and was trusted by his troops. He told his commanders to conserve their strength for the counteroffensive to come. His very presence at Verdun lifted morale and inspired renewed confidence in the Verdun forts as the backbone of a line of resistance. French artillery was concentrated to give the Germans a taste of attrition. Above all, Pétain grasped the importance of logistics. All rail links to Verdun were cut by German long-range artillery. Only a single narrow-gauge rail line remained open. Alongside the railway ran one second-class road. It was only 20 feet wide, just wide enough for two vehicles to pass. Batain took pains to ensure that supplies were maintained along this single viable route south, a road which a French writer named the Voie Sacre, Sacred Way. The trucks that bumped along it on solid rubber tires were commandeered from all over France, over 3,000 of them. Their lines never ended. In the critical week of February 25th, thousands of tons of supplies and 190,000 men passed along it. By June, vehicles were moving up and down this lifeline at the rate of one every 14 seconds, 6,000 vehicles a day. In the months ahead, two-thirds of the French army was to pass up this road destined for the meat grinder of Verdun. To some extent, these measures were playing into Falconhayn's hands. Yet, as de Castelnau knew, French doctrine and national sentiment made it inconceivable for the French army to abandon Verdun. The German advance was, in truth, already losing impetus before Pétain's measures began to take effect. Nearly a quarter of a million men were involved in the battle. The bloodletting was getting out of hand. Our blinded, wounded, crawling and shouting soldiers kept falling on top of us and died while splashing us with their blood. It was a living hell. Anyone who has not seen these fields of carnage will never be able to imagine it. When one arrives here, the shells are raining down everywhere with each step one takes. But in spite of this, it is necessary for everyone to go forward. One has to go out of one's way not to pass over a corpse lying at the bottom of the communication trench. Farther on, there are many wounded to tend, others who are carried back on stretchers to the rear. Some are screaming, others are pleading. One sees some who don't have legs, others without any heads, who have been left for several weeks on the ground. It scares you to no end. You, you are seeing suffering all around you. Men who can no longer see, men who can no longer speak, the quiet ones who are dead. What does all of that mean? There's a musician, there was a poet, there was an artist, there was a mathematician, a brilliant scientist. Ah, what a good doctor he could have been. 
You look at the potential and you see it destroyed. That is war. Falkenhayn made few reserves available, and 5th Army now rued its earlier caution in deferring the main infantry attack until the second day. As fire increased from French artillery on the left bank of the Meuse, particularly from guns near the Bois Burros Ridge and a hill known as Le Mort Homme, the Dead Man, the Germans regretted confining their first attack to the right bank. Persuaded by the Crown Prince and von Nobelsdorf that this flanking fire must be suppressed, Falkenhayn provided more troops so that the offensive could be extended to the left bank. A major attack centered on Le Mort Homme would be made on March 6th, followed quickly by a renewed push on the right bank towards Fort Vaux. The Crown Prince, for one, wanted the battle to be terminated once German casualties exceeded French losses. The hellish pattern of the Verdun fighting for months to come was firmly established in March. All German attempts to seize Le Mort Homme failed and each assault invariably prompted a French counterattack. Artillery fire from both sides was unrelenting. Uh, unlike other battles, uh, two other defining things I would say about Verdun. Uh, the amount of heavy artillery and massed artillery at that time had never been seen before. Uh, you had essentially a gun for every meter of ground. Uh, thousands of cannon from quick-firing light artillery, but mainly medium and heavy caliber shells. So one of the impressions on the men were of these overwhelming massive artillery bombardments. And because of that, all the positions were destroyed. By the end of March, German casualties totaled 81,607, only 7,000 fewer than the French. At Verdun, the ones who have suffered the most are the wounded and along with them, the stretcher bearers who transport them. Some of the bearers carry them from the front lines all the way to our post, one and one half kilometers. Other ones take them in order to carry them off to Fleury, and having arrived there, the wounded have almost another two kilometers to go by stretcher before they can be transported by car. Imagine such a trip under the shells which hardly ever stop through a landscape full of shell holes, tree trunks and wrecked wire, through deep mud and in certain areas through clay where the stretcher bearers sink down all the way to their waists, being forced to call for help to get themselves out of difficulty. The Germans too realized that they needed to adjust their command structure at Verdun. General von Gallwitz was given responsibility for the left bank and General von Mudra was entrusted with the right bank. Even with new commanders and fresh troops, April passed with Le Mort Alm and the neighboring heights, Colt 304, still beyond their clutches. Wavering between ruthlessness and self-doubt, Falkenhayn started to ponder the possible need to seek a decision elsewhere and the Crown Prince harbored even greater reservations about prolonging the battle. It was a war of destruction, both in humankind, in houses, buildings, and potential. That is what is the shame of war. How to survive it? How to survive it? That's the question. And be still a human being. So brutality breeds brutality. The challenge for the person in that role is to avoid it and keep from being a victim just as much as if you were shot. But to understand, people are fighting for their lives everywhere. If a man came up to me and he has an empty pistol and he draws it on me and it clicks, do I pull my pistol and kill him? If I could take him prisoner, wouldn't that be the better alternative? So that is what you fight, though, because of the brutality of war. It's automatic because you're, you're in survival mode. Even if you have someone that you know you must kill, you have to do that because that is your job. But then you have to fight to say, wait a minute, is there another way? Noblesdorf had no such misgivings and convinced Falkenhayn to continue the attack. After a heavier bombardment than that of February 21st, 
The Germans took Hill 304 early in May and had seized the whole of Le Mans Alm by the end of the month, but at a frightful cost. You must know that we are at the environs of Verdun, near Hill 304 and Mort Alm. What carnage. It is horrible to see what we are seeing. We have been here now for 12 days and every day we have serious losses. I consider myself lucky to have escaped up to now. Let's hope that it continues like this until we are relieved, which should be any day now. I hope so, because what you see every day is enough to break your heart. Moreover, we are not well because we have all caught dysentery. You can't eat, and I assure you that we're not very strong here. In short, we hope that we'll be lucky enough to make it back. This is heat, this stench, and all these unburied corpses and rotting flesh. We think that is what's making us ill. So that leads to one of, the other, um, one of the other unique features is that there are actually very few trenches. There are very few connected positions. Men lived in shell holes and fought over pieces of ground where the towns had vanished long ago. So a general looking on the map in the rear would say, take the town of Fleury, and Fleury had disappeared a couple of months pre previously, and it's just a, a mass of shell holes. So this uh, sense of devastation, desolation, isolation, that really wore on the men, and you can hear it in their, in their letters when they write home about having survived Verdun, that it was truly a, a hell for them. Petain's achievements in slowing the Germans were hardly extolled by Joffrey, who wished to adopt a more offensive stance, and was worried that the unending battle was soaking up reserves that would be required for the impending battle for the Somme. Joffrey's solution was to elevate Petain to the command of the Central Army Group, and appoint Robert Nevelle as Petain's successor at Second Army. Nevelle took direct control of the battle on May 1st. Along with Nevelle came Charles Mangin, a divisional commander nicknamed the Butcher, or Eater of Men, because of his belief in attacking regardless of losses. Rejecting Petain's advance to wait until he had enough men to strike on a broader front, Mangin, with the approval of Joffrey and Nivelle, hurled his 5th Division into a murderous yet vain attempt to recapture Fort Dumont on May 22nd, 23rd. The battle now created its own momentum, resembling an all-consuming monster impossible to control. You know, one of the fascinating things about Verdun is that it's a war within a war. Um, the amount of material being poured in by both armies, um, the commitment in troops, the commitment in, in blood and treasure, uh, it became its own entity uh, that the generals eventually who launched the attacks uh, on, on the German side eventually lost control of, and the French generals on the opposite side were, were basically just trying to grasp it by its reins. Attack-minded commanders on both sides ensured that there would be no pause in the slaughter. Verdun is very unique because of that. Uh, you have a lot of men rotating through there, unlike certain other battles in the Great War or in other military conflicts. Uh, Three-quarters of the French army was rotated through Verdun, so it's a universal experience. Almost all French soldiers can talk about their time at Verdun. They didn't serve there once, they served there on multiple tours. Disappointed at the negligible progress on the right bank, Noblesdorf won Falkenhayn's endorsement for a new five-division assault in this sector. The attack, codenamed May Cup, commenced on June 1st, with the objective of capturing Fort Val, Fort Seville, and the strong point called the Orange de Thumont, seen as the final obstacle shielding Verdun. At Fort Vaux, the garrison fought valiantly, disputing every yard of the dark underground passages against grenade, gas, and flamethrower attacks. We had no communication with Zeria for three days and nights because the bombardment did not let up. We were not even able to get our rations, and we only ate biscuits and chocolate, and there was almost nothing to drink. Finally, we were able to get our rations, but with a lot of difficulty. Therefore, we're glad to get out of here, because we've been completely brutalized by the bombardment. 
One has to have a strong heart to endure such a martyrdom. This is not war. It's a massacre. Oh, when will it end? It's terrible to see what's happening. Finally, after enduring six days of the unendurable and suffering from extreme thirst, the gallant garrison capitulated. The next day, the Germans took hold of the Orange de Thiamont, only to lose it later in the afternoon. Over the next four months, Orange de Thiamont would change hands 14 times. Pétain's line of resistance was cracking, and he was becoming ever more irritated by British inaction on the Somme offensive, combined with Nivelle's profligacy with troops in incessant counterattacks at Verdun. General Pétain remembered the sight of French troops moving forward for one more assault. Their expression seemed frozen by a vision of terror. Their gait and their postures betrayed a total dejection. They sagged beneath the weight of horrifying memories. They had passed through a fiery ordeal, and neither they nor the Europe they had once known were ever the same after it. By June 12th, the Second Army had just one fresh brigade in reserve. The Germans were hamstrung by their own manpower problems at this critical moment. Brusilov's offensive against the Austrians on June 4th had forced Falkenhayn to release three divisions from the west for the eastern front. While the original aim of the Verdun offensive had long since been obscured, the cost in blood had been too high for either side to risk national dishonor by becoming the first to withdraw from the battle. I stayed ten days next to a man who was chopped in two. There was no way to move him. He had one leg on the parapet and the rest of his body in the trench. It stank, and I had to chew tobacco the whole time in order to endure this torment. The intransigent Noblesdorf ordered one more assault on Fort Seville on July 11th, and some 30 soldiers reached its glasses within sight of Verdun before they were pushed back, captured, or killed. This was the nearest the Germans came to Verdun. The opening of the Somme Offensive on July 1st changed the whole strategic picture, and Falkenhayn directed the 5th Army to adopt a defensive attitude. The Crown Prince's wishes were finally granted on August 23rd, when the Kaiser sanctioned Noblesdorf's transfer to the Eastern Front. Romania's entry into the war on the Allied side four days later precipitated the downfall of Falkenhayn, who had guaranteed the Kaiser that this would not happen. He was succeeded as Chief of the General Staff by Field Marshal von Hindenburg, who brought with him as his own Chief of Staff, Ludendorff, the hero of Liege. The direction of the war on the Western Front was about to take a dramatic change. After visiting the Western Front in early September, Hindenburg and Ludendorff made crucial changes in German tactics and strategy. On September 2nd, a strict defensive posture at Verdun was decreed. To the German soldiers facing the inevitable French counterstroke at Verdun, these changes were of little immediate help. The French struck on October 24th. Ouvrage de Thiamont and Fleury were rapidly retaken, as was Fort Duomont, which fell to Moroccan troops. Fort Vaux was recaptured on November 2nd, as was much of the ground lost between February and July. On December 15th, another attack carried the French lines two miles beyond Dormont, but the Germans clung to Les Morts Alm. This last convulsion brought the agony of Verdun to an end. French casualties tallied 377,000. German losses numbered 357,000. No one had secured any discernible advantage from the slaughter. I think uh, it was a very different time. Um, certainly no military would be willing to, uh, any sort of functioning military would be able to t sustain the losses that they did and continue on. Uh, to, to continue fighting for as long as they did, for 52 months after all the casualties, after all the 
horrendous conditions that they had to deal with. I think it was the mentality of the people at the time. Uh, certainly to a some degree they were, you might say they were tougher than us, but ultimately they were just people put in a very difficult situation. Um, they believed that the war was a war of survival, the French did. Uh, their nation had been invaded and they weren't willing to abide by a foreign power uh, occupying a portion of their, their territory. Um, despite the losses and all that, there was still this deeper sense of duty. As a French citizen, perhaps it stems back to the philosopher Rousseau, but uh, that a citizen was, would do his duty and this fell under those guys and uh, ultimately uh, the, the French soldiered on for it. Falkenhayn's failure to reconcile the means to the end had caused his original strategy to backfire. In the process, he drained the lifeblood from the German army as well as from the French. Neither side would completely recover from the Battle of Verdun before the armistice.